Good afternoon, everybody. It's truly a pleasure to welcome you to the 12th annual Lee's Light McCarthy Visiting Author Program. The Visiting Author Program brings world-renowned authors to Stewart to share their knowledge and experiences with all of you. This program was the dream of a beloved Stewart English teacher, Mrs. Vicki McCarthy. The program was established in her memory and also honors past English department chairs, Betty Lees and Nancy Light. Thanks to the Visiting Author Program, Stewart has been able to host some of the most significant voices in contemporary literature. Paul Muldoon, Jonathan Safran Foer, Jhumpa Lahiri, Naomi Shiab Nye, Edwidge Dandekat, Jane Hirschfield, Mark Salzman, Tracy K. Smith, Juan Felipe Herrera, Firuzu, Firuzu Dumas, Sarah Kay, and today, Ian Lee. Ian Lee was born in 1972 in Beijing. After receiving her Bachelor of Science from Peking University, she moved to the United States in 1996 to study immunology at the University of Iowa. However, however after taking writing course as a way to improve her English, she found herself writing fiction. She decided to change the focus of her studies, entering the famed Iowa Writers Workshop after receiving her master's degree in science in 2000. She earned her Master of Fine Arts in 2005 with a focus on fiction and creative nonfiction. Since then, she has authored six works of fiction, Must I Go, Where Reason Ends, Kinder Than Solitude, A Thousand Years of Good Prayers, The Vagrants, and Gold Boy, Emerald Girl, and the memoirs, Dear Friend from My Life, I Write to You in Your Life. She is the recipient of many awards, including a Penn Hemingway Award, a Penn Jean Stein Book Award, a MacArthur Foundation Fellowship, and a Wyndham Campbell Prize. She was featured in the New Yorker's 20 Under 40 Fiction Issue, and her work has appeared in The New Yorker, A Public Space, The Best American Short Stories, and The O. Henry Prize Stories, among other publications. She teaches today at Princeton University, and she lives here in Princeton. So please join me in welcoming Ian Lee to Stewart Country Day School. Well, thank you everyone. And hello to people there I cannot see. And thank you for coming to the reading. I thought I'm, you know, I write fiction, but I sometimes I write short nonfiction pieces. And I'm going to read two short pieces I published in the New Yorker. And partly I think both pieces are about when I was a high school student. One was about high school and the other one was right after high school, I went to the army. And so the other one was about coming back from the army before I went to college. So, so I'm going to start with the piece about high school. Listening is believing. Be content with what you have. Desire nothing and nothing will be lacking. By the time I entered high school, I could tell which of my classmates had been brought up like me until to a gene, to wisdom worn as eggshell of pride. Privately, we desired all the things our other classmates who had not been raised on defeatism owned. Adidas sweatshirts, Sony Walkman, cassette tapes of Karen Carpenter, and Hong Kong pop singers, VCRs that play parroted movies from abroad. This was Beijing in 1988. Kentucky Fried Chicken had opened its first store in China near Tiananmen Square the previous year. A new classmate backed up, bragged about having tasted the famous Colonel's recipe. That fall, a group of well-connected girls got hold of a popular American miniseries, The Thornbirds. I don't know if The Thornbirds is known to the kids today, but I think the parents would know. That fall, a group of well-connected girls got hold of a popular American miniseries, The Thornbirds. They would regularly gather at one girl's home and watch the saga which was said in Australian outback. Between classes, they discussed the lifelong love between Maggie and Father Ralph, 
the renegade priest she met when she was young, who later gave her a child, but left her to pursue his ambition in the Vatican. The girls recited to one another the passage about the mythical bird that spends its life searching for the perfect form, form and then impales itself while singing the world's most beautiful song. Around that time, my father brought me the least expensive tape recorder he could find and modern American English, a textbook with four accompanying cassettes designed for Chinese people planning to go to America. Every morning, he woke me up at six and turned on the recorder. The taped conversations between a man and a woman became the soundtracks of my morning. From them, I learned that in a new place, I should remember a prominent landmark, a McDonald's or a Burger King, for instance, or a church spire. Not to ask a woman's age or a man's income, to arrive half an hour late when invited to dinner, and to always bring chocolates for the hostess. The bits and pieces I picked up from the girls about the thorn birds fascinated and pained me. Father Ralph's blue eyes and chiseled face, Maggie's innocence, the seductive kind, which made a man lose his head. The elderly aunt, beautiful despite her wickedness. I was a good, eaves I was a good eavesdropper and decoder, but neither skill gave me claim to the thorn birds. What I'd pieced together felt as if it were something stolen from others. It would be inappropriate if I said Maggie's name, even to myself. Then my luck changed. I was befriended by one of the girls who described the story to me, scene by scene, shot by shot. The listening was a limited substitute for seeing. I could not envisage the red of Megan's hair, Maggie's hair, or the color of her dress, rose gray, as my friend called it. Still, Maggie's finger, pierced by a thorn, bled just as mine did when I punctured it with a needle while doing my least favorite chore, making quilts for the coming winter. Poetically, yet inadequately, I could imagine Father Ralph holding her injured hand. I waited for an in invitation from my new friend so that I could see Maggie and Ralph with my own eyes, but the invitation was never issued. I did not yet know that some people were assigned a fate that left them on the sidelines listening. It was beyond a young person's understanding that such a fate could also be one's fortune. Lao Tzu's teaching did not mute the disappointment of being denied the thorn bird, but I still had modern American English. The eggshell of pride had been replaced by the armor of dream. The McDonald's and Burger Kings of the textbook were not so far from Maggie on the beach. Ralph in the garden, with the bird in the air flying ceaselessly from hatching to death. I had not seen these things, but I had listened to them being described to me. My future, I decided, was to be placed among them. After my arrival in America, I decided not to watch the songbirds. I have avoided the novel by Colin McCuller, on which the miniseries was based. Perhaps my dream, in the end, was not an American dream, and my fantasy not a teenage girl's fantasy of love. It's the intensity of one's imagination that creates a romance. Eavesdropping and decoding underscore only what does not belong to one. Inventing through listening and inventing knows no abstinence.
allows one to own a memory permanently. I have to apologize for my dog. <laughs> okay, come on. He, he gets excited. So that's one piece about high school. And the second piece is, uh, as I said, I went to Chinese army. It was an involuntary service after high school. So I went there when I was 18, I came back when I was 19. And the title is A Soldier Home. The summer after my year of involuntary service in the Chinese army, I read Hemingway compulsively. I had always been shy and private, which had not helped me in the army. But my experience would have been worse if it weren't for the novels, Dickens, Hardy, D.H. Lawrence, all in English, that I had taken with me to camp. Despite my rudimentary understanding of the language, most evenings, after lights out, I would sneak away to the platoon storage room where I could take a leave from my small miseries, the bullying of the officers, the dreariness of the combat drills, and enter a world filled with dramas of love and death and madness. The barricade that I had built for myself with books began to collapse once I returned to Beijing. My mother, who had been born after her mother lost her sanity, used to tell my older sister and me that she would become our grandmother if we did not behave. That summer, she seemed to be fulfilling her threats. My sister had just started her first job and had a boyfriend. I was 19, not yet in college, not old enough, in my parents' opinion, to have a boyfriend. In, Hardy, in Hardy's world, life could be bleak, yet still picturesque. In, in Lawrence, madness could be chilling, yet maintain a mysterious attraction. There was no beauty in my mother's deterioration. Anything could lead to an eruption. The droning of cicadas from daybreak to sunset, the hot and humid smog of July, my sister's absence at a family dinner, my father's cooking. My mother's anger, though, was never targeted at me. I was her lost child returned from the army. I was reading a farewell to arms one night when my father came into my bedroom. The family was counting on me, he said. Neither he nor my sister could keep my mother from going mad. She loves you more than your sister or me, he said. I promise to try my best. When he left, I turned off the light. There was not a trace of breeze. Through the open window, I could hear a chess party, a group of old bachelors and their street lamp laughingly cursing one another's moves on the chessboard, chessboard. I listened to a man slapping mosquitoes and wishes that I were the hero of Hemingway's novel. I would have given up the use of both my legs to be in Italy, drinking vermouth, watching horse races, and exchanging off-colored jokes with my fellow officers as the old bachelors were doing outside. The next morning, when my father returned empty-handed from the grocery store, unable to buy our element of eggs because the eggs had sold out, my mother cursed him with the poisonous words that we had learned to live with. It was the last summer the eggs, cooking oil, flour, and rice were rationed. Although they were now also available at higher price, the disgust price, as it was called. It was not that we couldn't afford the eggs, just as it was now the vegetable overcooked by my father or the perceived lack of reverence on my sister's part that was driving my mother to the verge of madness. All her life, she had been plagued by the fear of losing her sanity. And that summer, she seemed to be gathering her remaining strength to condemn the world, my father mostly for being unable to save her. After lunch, while my mother's rage had still not abated, 
I stuffed the ration book into a straw basket. Where are you going? My mother asked. I clutched the Hemingway novel and said that I was going to buy eggs. In the treeless courtyard of the grocery store, a line of about 30 people had already formed. The woman at the end of the line, sitting on a brick and shading her face with an open newspaper, told me that eggs would be sold again at four o'clock. I stood under the July sun without moving for two hours, but the person waiting in line was far from my real self. Rather, I was Frederick retreating in the rain, Frederick swimming down the river to dodge bullets, and later Frederick in civilian clothes, reuniting with his love and sailing across the lake to Switzerland. All would be well if you lived in a novel, even when death crept up on you, the end would come in just a few pages or a few lines. Someone tapped on my shoulder. I looked up and my father, avoiding my eyes, asked me to go home. He would wait for the ex, he said. I knew that it would be a relief for him too, to stand in the sun, but I was not ready to return not ready to take up my own life. I told him that I would wait. He nodded, and a few minutes later, he came back with an icy cold bottle of soda and a popsicle stick with a number painted on it, which I was to return with the empty bottle for the 20 fan deposit. I watched my father walk away, a defeated man. The popsicle stick was warm. The bottle was cold, and I was not Frederick. His war was over, beautifully, tragically, mercifully. Thank you. That is the two, the second piece. I think someone is going to start a Q and A. I imagine. Sunny, do you have a question? Yeah. The first question is from 12th grader Nina. She asks, what inspired you to later become a writer? Was there a specific instance or event in your life that sparked your desire to write? Mm -hmm. Yes. So I think we talked a little bit, you know, today or other sessions. I, I wasn't always wanting to become a writer, but ever since I was young, I was a reader. And opening a book, as you know, as I was reading, opening a book really gave me another space, an entrance to another world, you know, sort of escape from reality. So I always loved reading. And I grew up without an access to public library. So the first time I was in library, I was in middle school. There was no library available and uh, we did not have a lot of books. So I think there was the kind of hunger that only a starved child would know. If a, if a child was starved and the child sees the food, then he would just swallow it. And I think it's the same about books because I did not have access to books or to a lot of literature. Anytime I grabbed a book, I would read. I remember when I was eight, when I was in second grade, a, a friend of mine, <laughs> she thought she gave me a copy of the arabian nights and we both thought arabian nights was a fairy tale book as a book for children and she said she stole the book from her house and she, she she said you know you have to return it within two days so nobody noticed i stole it for you so i read the book in two days at eight i had no understanding of all these naked people running around it was most fascinating, but also inexplicable. But I think it was, you know, those things that you don't understand that stayed with you, or you did not understand as a child, these things stayed with you. So I think I would say I wasn't a writer, but I was a curious person as a child. I was a, I was a big reader and curiosity and, and the desire to read. And I think these things later, became part of the motivation to become a writer.
And Leah, do you have a question next? Uh, yes, I have the next question. So um, ninth grader Anita Liu asks, as an, as an Asian American author, were there any difficulties when it came to publishing your book because of your race? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, I, I mean, in my case, n not, I would say n not noticeably, which means I, I, I would say I would call myself lucky in that I had good readers early on. I had good professors and I had good people working on my behalf to sell my books. But I think there's a, another, I think there's a, there's an opposite side of, you know, being a Asian American author that you would always be pigeonholed into that position that you're supposed to write about certain things that I, I've been fighting all my career because I think part of the marketing people's thinking certainly is different than our thinking. So at, at, at the beginning, I was always presented as, you know, the oppressed Chinese girl escaping China and getting freedom and liberty in America and becoming a writer, which is a, you know, a good version of China. American dream that you can sell. And, but that was not me. So I sort of re resisted that. And, but I, I think that kind of thinking is always there, but there are good readers. The first time I published a story, I published a story in the New Yorker about an older woman who worked as a nanny in the private, in the first private school in Beijing. And I was in Iowa at the time. And one day I met two older ladies about the same age as my character, you know, two white ladies in the street. They both grabbed my hands and they said, well, you know, we were reading your story and we were discussing and arguing which one of us would be the character in your story. And I think that's the kind of reaction, you know, I look forward to in a writer is it doesn't matter i think you know if a if a reader can understand and can put herself in my character's shoes and that's that's that to me is important so i wouldn't say i felt or i have experienced a lot of difficulties based on my race or country or origin but of course you know as we all know reality is reality so I did, you know, n this is not about publishing, but for a while I couldn't get uh, my green card based on my writing. I got rejected several times because I applied green card as an extraordinary artist. And Homeland Security is such an interesting place. They always were there documents very interestingly, they return an email and say, you know, by our law, we are saying if you're extraordinary, for instance, if you have received a Nobel Prize, we'll give you a green card. And I, I just happen not to have, <laughs> I mean, I still haven't received my Nobel Prize. So, so that took a while. I think that struggle, I think, I would say that struggle is probably unique to immigrant writers, just not being able to find it legal status. Yes. And Sarah, do you have the next question? Yes, this question is from Layla Fair, who is a junior. And she said, how do you do your research for your stories and or poems? Um, and in terms of going out into the real world or actually like looking things up? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I. You know, there are different writers. Some writers do research extensively and they know everything about the period they write. And then there are the other writers who don't research. I'm sort of in between. I, my, I think my principle about doing research is do just enough. And if I can do just enough research for me to get a, a sense of the time, a sense of the place. 
instead of gathering all this information that a writer wants to put into a book, and then it becomes like a touristy business for the period or for the place. So, so I always do just enough research and I can share a few stories about researching. And one of the important research I would do is, you know, we can read people's books. Say, I just, I was just talking about the book I was writing about uh, the, the gold rush in, 19, in, eight, in 1840s in California. There are plenty of history books or books written about the gold rush, but they are, if they're written by people from a later point, these are digested material. For me, I think the most important thing was to see what people did or thought or felt at the time. So I was able to find a few books. One of them was written by this woman who traveled from Boston to California with her husband. Her husband was a, was a physician, but her husband wanted to speculate in the gold mine to make money. And the woman, the whole time she was there, she was writing letters back to, to her sister. And later they collected the, 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 the letters. And that's the kind of research that you would not, or information that you would not really see in, in, in the book unless people lived through that era, time or era. For instance, she talked about, I mean, I, there were a few things I remembered. One was uh, Independence Day. The, the miners in, in California, they wanted to read the Declaration of Independence together on the Independence Day. But of course, nobody remembered what independence, what declaration of independence said. So they special ordered one from Sacramento and, and yet the messenger was late. So on the day, all these, I mean, these were immigrants too, people from all over the world, Europe and South America, Asia, and they gathered together and nobody knew what the declaration of independence said. So in the end, they decided to write a version of their own and they just made up a version and they read it aloud as a celebration of American independence. And that's the kind of the details that you would get from people who lived through that period. And this woman, when she said, you know, when she traveled, I think we, we, often, we often see those movies, for instance, set, you know, during the gold rush or wild, wild west. You know, the, the typical scenery, you know, a salon and, you know, streets and people shooting each other on horses. But this woman said one thing, it always stayed with me. She said, you know, when she went into the salon, everything looked green because their window, they did not really have glasses. They did not have, could not afford glasses for windows. So they cut the bottom of the, all the bottles. They were all green and they put the bottles on top on the wall to make a sort of an opaque window. So everything inside looked green. And that's the kind of the detail I think research helped me. And sometimes I, I, I wrote, I, part of my novel coming out is set in Nova Scotia in Canada. I did the, I did the research after I finished the novel. And partly, I, I did not want the place to limit my imagination. So I wrote everything, and I wrote the whole draft. And then we went to Nova Scotia. We drove around. And I walked down the street, and I saw this one big house. I thought, that is my character's house. He died in that house. So I took a picture. I think that research is more just to get a sense of the of the place and at the time. So, so I I do like research, and but research is a rabbit hole. You can go down there forever and ever and ever, and never surface. So I also feel that a writer has to be disciplined. Thank you. The next question is from tenth grader Susanna Weiss. She said. I know that your past of being from and then immigrating from China has been very influential to your writing. How do you think your writing would have been different today if you did not have that experience? Yeah. Do you think you would be writing at all today if you did not have that experience? Yeah, it's a good question. I, it, I, one thing I want to make, make clear is I actually, I had never written in Chinese. Chinese is my mother tongue. 
English as my first language in writing. I've never written in Chinese. I would not have become a writer had I stayed in China. And partly, I think Chinese language, Chinese language is a beautiful language. I mean, I grew up reciting Chinese poetry, Asian poetry. And yet I also grew up with this language that is heavily used for propaganda. And it affects how you use the language. When I was in high school, yeah, I mean, two, two stories. One was when I was in high school, you know, we had those orotation or contest. So you write a beautiful essay, patriot, patriotic essay, and you read a lot to the whole class or whole school. And somehow I think this one time it was my turn to enter the, to represent my class to, to, in the contest. And I did write a beautiful piece. And that, it was not only beautiful, it was very moving. I not only moved the teachers to, into, like, to tears, I even moved myself to tears. And yet, even then, I knew these were all empty words. I was 16, and I knew they were not real words. So when you were 16, I mean, I imagine that's your age. You don't want to live a fake life. You don't want to speak you know, languages that are not yours. So I was, I was sensitive and conscious that I could write propaganda in Chinese, and I did not want that. And when I was in the army, I had a very bad relationship with my squad leader. But she liked me. She liked me about one thing is I could write. So every week, each squad was supposed to turn in like a piece about army life or about anything, you know. And she always assigned me to write. And I got really upset. I said, you know, I said, we should take turns. And she said, you can write well. It's easy for you to write. I said, what if I don't write? She said, if you don't write, you have to go clean the toilet or the pigsty. And that to me, again, I was, had I had a little bit more integrity, I probably would have said, I'm going to clean the toilet or pigsty. I don't want to write for you. But I also hated cleaning the pigsty. So I thought, OK, I will write in exchange for a little bit of time away from pigs. So, so that also was my experience with using Chinese language. I could use it well, but I didn't enjoy that experience. So had I not immigrated to Ameri immigrated to America, I probably would have not written at all, and I would not have known that what I missed. Okay, so the next question is from Jaden Piotrowski, and she asks, what is something you wish someone told you when you first came to the United States and started writing? Ah, that's a good question. I, when I first started writing, what, what did I, you know, I feel I was lucky enough to have met a couple really good teachers and early on they told me important things that I needed to know as a writer. And for instance, I mean, I shared earlier, I said, a, a, a teacher said, the moment you start writing, you lose half of your readers. If you're a woman, people say, not interested in reading women's writing. If you're an immigrant, they would say, not interested. And those are not your real readers, and you don't write for them. This is a very good piece of advice from my, my teacher. And some useful advice, for instance, you know, we didn't have time to talk about it during the lunchtime session. This one teacher said, you know, anytime your characters get stuck, see if one of them can touch the other one, just like a tap on the shoulder or a handshake. And she said, you would be surprised how physical touch changes the dyna dynamic between the characters. And that, again, is very useful advice as a, for me as a young writer. What I did, I, I you know, I'm just thinking, I'm, I'm trying to think very hard. Is there anything that I wished? I wish I could go back and tell myself instead of the teachers telling me. I wish I could go back to tell my younger self just to be patient. I wasn't a patient. I was a, I, I'm a patient person. In life, I'm patient, but I'm not, 
I wasn't very patient with my writing when I first started. There was always this urge thinking, oh, you know, I need to finish the story. I need to finish the story. I need to finish a book. There was that hurry that I knew was there when I was younger. But now I feel that there's no hurry. You know, it, it takes, writing takes its time. So I, I do wish I could tell my younger self just to be a little more patient. Um, the next question that we have is from Selena Liu, who is a sophomore. And she said, during the times where you felt like giving up, who or what was your inspiration and or motivation in pushing you forward and continuing you to be a writer? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, writing certainly is one of the most difficult things. I mean, I, I, I was a scientist and I find science not too hard for me. I, I had a natural feeling for science and and i realized i wanted something more difficult and it turned out writing was much much more difficult than i thought and i chose a very difficult career but i the inspiration or i maybe i talked a little bit about being a scientist being a scientist you can never really give up trying it's the same as writing i think in a minor scale, if you work on this story for two months, it's still not working. Of course, you want to give up. But I think there's a reason it's not working. I think instead of giving up, you would want, if, if you're a scientist, if an experiment does not work, you don't say, I'm giving this, this up. You're going to say, let me see the conditions. Let me see the setup. Is there anything I can change with this setup? Is there anything I did wrong in this thinking? It's the same as writing. If something is not working, you know, if you give up, you just say, this is not going to work. But I think the more important question is, why does this not work? Why, why is it not working? What happened? So I think if you keep that kind of curiosity and say, yes, you know, stories can fail. We can write, a, I can write a bad story. I can write, a, a, you know, a boring story. But why? You know, what, where, which part is boring? So I have to share this funny story. Years ago, I wrote a story. I actually really loved the first draft. It was about a young woman, a young woman traveling to England by herself, and she stayed in the English B and B. And I showed it to my New Yorker editor. She 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 happens to be an English woman, and she is hilarious. She said, she said, you know, the character is really interesting, but the story is so boring. I said, which part is boring? She said, well, that part about the English B and B, it's so boring. And I said, maybe you are biased. Maybe you're from England. You don't find it interesting. I find it interesting. Well, she said, no, 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 it's so boring. I said, well, then what do I do? She said, I think you should take England out of your story. I was quite shocked when she said that because the story was set in, in everything was in England. If I take if I took England out of the story, there was no story. I said, I cannot. And she said, Well, yes, I think you can take England out of the story. It's not about England. And in the end, I think she was right. I was able to write another draft. I did not set it in England, I set it in Iowa. And it was the same character, the same story, same backstory except she wasn't traveling in England. She was just living in Iowa and the story worked. So I felt I learned from that editor is if something is not working, you have to find a way to say, you know, let me change something. Let me change the setting. Let me take England out of the story. <laughs> let me rewrite the story. So, so I, I think giving up is actually quite easy. One, one thing that you know, I think this, the student asked about inspiration. One, one thing I always remembered from one of my teachers, she said, you know, she said, by nature, I'm a lazy person. I would rather, you know, sit there and drink a, a beer instead of writing. But I always remember, I always remember to imagine myself six months later, how miserable I would feel if I did not persist or persevere in this 
writing. And I think it's the same. Giving up is very easy. But I like to imagine, you know, two months later, I look at the story that I give up and I thought, oh, I, I feel miserable because I gave it up. I would rather not feel that misery. So I would just feel the misery of create, creation or creating the story now. Sunny, do you have another question? Um, I think that was the last question, just keeping in mind for the time. Yes, I think we're about, the time is about right. Well, thank you so much, Yun. That's This has been wonderful. I just love listening to you talk about your stories and about how you write. And as I said at the middle school one, it's like we're sitting in your living room and it's just very pleasant to be able to sit and visit with you. So. Thank you so much. You've made our first virtual visiting author program a smashing success. But we do want you to come back in person sometime. Oh, I would love to come back in person just to say hi to the students. I hope yes. so. I hope yes. so. Well, okay. thank you. It's been a pleasure and an honor. Yes. Thank you so much for hosting me today. Oh, you're welcome. Yes. All right. Take care. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye. Take care. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Okay, time's up to call. Okay.